Today we're going to be uh, looking at or diving into, I should say, the fifth of our seven values of our local community. And this value is earnestly desire the expression of the spiritual gifts. And that key value is actually a command that comes to us in the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 1, where Paul writes, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. A few verses later, Paul clarifies why prophecy is to be prized, writing in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. So tongues is for personal edification. It's to build up oneself. Uh, unless, of course, it's a public tongue that needs to be interpreted. And whilst prophecy is for the building up of the whole church. So this is a value that's important for us as a local community, but it's also a command to all Christians. We're to pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. The Bible tells us that God gives the spiritual gifts to the church for the common good of all of the saints. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, to each person the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the benefit of the all. Benefit of all. Not only that, but they're also given for mission, so that we might be about our Father's business, that we can share the good news concerning Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus in Luke 24, 48 to 49, said to the disciples, You are the witnesses of these things, and look, I'm sending you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And so, you know, they wait until the day of Pentecost when they receive the Spirit. And Paul's letters are written to the non-Jewish congregations that he's established around the Mediterranean. And Paul has come to the realisation that since the Jewish Messiah has been revealed as Jesus of Nazareth by his resurrection of the dead, the spirits of all over the nations have been delegitimized. Their weapon of death has been undone. As Christ has conquered death and with the resurrection of the Messiah the whole cosmic and spiritual world has been reorganized as such the nations now need to be encouraged to turn their back on their ancestral gods and worship the God of Israel those who turn their back on their ancestral gods are going to be adopted into Israel's story as sons of Abraham and will receive life in the age to come as Paul writes in Romans chapter 9 verse 25 as he also says in Hosea, I will call those who are not my people, my people, and I will call her who was unloved, my beloved. For Paul, this is the proof of adoption is the spirit, the receiving of the spirit. And in Galatians chapter four, verses three to seven, he puts it this way. So also we, when we were minors, we were enslaved under the elemental spirits of the world. But when the appropriate time had come, God sent out his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law, so that we might be adopted as sons with full rights. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, who calls Abba Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir through God. So the nations, having once been enslaved under the evil spirits, fearfully offering them sacrifices for protection, now they've been adopted into Israel's story. They're no longer slaves. They're now sons. They're no longer fearful. They're now loved. They were not a people. They are now the people. So Paul writes in Romans 8, 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery leading again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. And if children, then heirs, namely heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. 
So all Christians, therefore, followers of the Messiah, have received the Holy Spirit. There's no second class citizens at all. As Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 3 through to 6, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you two were called by one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So Paul says it quite clearly that there's one body and one Spirit. And one of the reasons that we all need to desire these spiritual gifts is that they bring freedom. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 1, 6-7, I remind you to rekindle God's gift that you possess through the laying on of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of self-control. We're called to rekindle the gift of God, to stir a small flame, a flickering flame, into a great furnace. I don't know about your life, but I know in my own life I need the power of God. I need love. I need self-control. I'm at war with my own passions, my own will, my own desires, and I need the Holy Spirit's power to change the things that I love in order that I can have self-control. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 writes, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. And this is why fasting and other spiritual disciplines are so important. They're the means by which we discipline our bodies and keep them under control. It's like press them down and give them, you know, enslave them to keep them under our control so that it's doing what we want it to do, not what it wants to do. And throughout Paul's letters, he mentions various gifts, both from the Holy Spirit in Christ to the church and most we're familiar with these gifts, you know, Romans 12, uh, Ephesians 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Um, perhaps the Corinthians list is the most well known because it also includes the, the most controversial gifts of the Spirit in, in our age, you know, healing, miracles, prophecy, tongues, and their interpretation. Let us, however, read all of these lists. So, Romans 12. Four to eight, just as one body, we have many members, not all the members serve the same function. So we are many in the one body in Christ and individually we're members who belong to one another. We've got different gifts according to the grace that's been given to us. If the gift is prophecy, that individual must use it in proportion to his faith. If it's service, he must serve. If teaching, he must teach. It is, if it's exhort exhortation he must exhort if it's contributing he must do so with sincerity if it's leadership he must do so with diligence if it's showing mercy he must do so with cheerfulness so here paul lists prophecy service or you know administration uh, teaching exhortation encouraging others contributing or giving generously to others uh, leadership, showing mercy and kindness. These are all spiritual gifts. They're all gifts of grace. And in Ephesians 4 verses 11 to 12, we read, And he, this is Christ, gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, that is to build up the body of Christ, until we attain all of the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God, a mature person, attaining to the measure of Christ's full stature. So Jesus the Messiah not only sends individual gifts into our lives through his grace, but also different types of people that they might be a blessing and building blocks within the body of the Messiah, the church, so that it can grow up, so that it can mature. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 to 11, we read, now, there are different gifts, but the same spirit. And there's different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different results, but the same God who produces all of them in everyone. To each person, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the benefit of all. For one person, it's given through the spirit, the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge, according to the same spirit. To another, faith and the same spirit 
to another the gift of healing by the one spirit, to another performance of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernment of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. It is one and the same spirit distributing as he decides to each person who produces all these things. So speaking particularly of tongues and prophecy, it might be helpful just to define our terms. And Sam Storms write, the gift of tongues is simply spirit energized ability to pray, worship, give thanks or speak in a language other than your own or the one that you might have learned at school. A New Testament prophecy is a human report of a divine revelation. Prophecy is a speaking forth in merely human words of something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. And while each of us is commanded to desire the spiritual gifts so that the whole church can be blessed, we're also told that discernment is needed. First Thessalonians 19 to 20, we read, do not stifle the Holy Spirit, do not scoff at prophecies. In 1 John 4, chapter 4, verse 1, we read, Dear friends, do not believe anyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there's many false prophets in the world. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 29 to 32, Let two or three people prophesy, and let others evaluate what is said. But if someone is prophesying and another person receives a revelation of the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. Remember that the people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and they can take turns. Love um, Paul's pastoral advice there. You know, you're in control. You can take turns. You can stop if you need to stop effectively. You know, it's good advice. Prophecy needs to be evaluated needs to be tested against the holy scriptures god is not the author of chaos or of confusion he will not contradict the holy scriptures where the spirit is breathed out paul expects that all of the spiritual gifts would function in healthy holy spirit empowered churches until jesus returns in first corinthians chapter 13 verses 9 through to 12 now our knowledge is partial and incomplete even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflectors in a mirror. But then we shall see everything with perfect clarity. And that I will know, ha know now is partial or incomplete. But then I will know everything completely just as God knows me completely. So we live in a partial, incomplete time. We don't know God fully, as he knows us. Um, at present, even prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture, but one day we will see everything with perfect clarity. There are some who would say that the time of perfection has already come, you know, that it's not referring to the second coming, but rather the church agreeing which scriptures should be in the New Testament. I, for one, just don't think that's what the text says. And secondly, I don't think I've got the whole picture now. Um, do I see everything with perfect clarity right now? I don't, I don't think so. It's more like that puzzling reflections in a mirror. And I will know clearly when the Lord comes and when I see him as he is. I'm looking forward to that return, for he is the perfect one who brings his perfection. So, friends, we should acknowledge that all of the gifts can be manipulated. They, they can be abused. Prophecy particularly can be abused, but so can false teaching or even administrators if they're siphoning off funds for themselves or anything else. We can see from the abuses within the church in Corinth in particular, within some of you know, Paul's Gentile communities there, even in the first century, that they've had damaging experiences, that they're prone to forbidding the speaking of tongues and for despising prophecy. That's why Paul had to write, don't do these things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 39, he writes, so dear brothers and sisters, be eager to prophecy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. 
He had to say it because there were those among the leadership within the church who wanted to draw a line under it or just forbid people from speaking in tongues. After all, it's only edifying that person. It's not edifying the whole church, you know. So each of us has something to contribute to our, our own function so that the whole community might grow up into maturity and become more like Jesus day by day. That's why Paul instructs us in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. But be sure that everything is done properly and in order. God's not the order of chaos, okay? He brings order. He brings light out of darkness and order out of chaos. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12, since you are so eager to have the special abilities that the Spirit gives, seek those that will strengthen the whole church. So this is the reason for the spiritual gifts, to strengthen the whole church. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul speaks at length about faith, about hope and about love being the three things that truly matter and will survive with us beyond death when tongues and prophecy, all those things are going to fade away at the end. But the faith, hope and love will remain. And love is the best of them all. John Wimber put it this way. The test of spiritual maturity is not the ability to speak in tongues or to prophesy or to memorize scripture. It's the ability to love God and others. Learning to serve others by loving the unlovely, the less fortunate, the lost or the broken. And that's, this is the highest call that we would fulfill our purpose on earth. So friends, are you eager for the special abilities that the spirit gives? If not, why not? You know, we're instructed to seek after those things. Paul instructs us to seek those things to strengthen the whole church, that the whole church might be built up. And we're told not to forbid them and not to discourage them. OK, so. And that isn't to say that private tongues are wrong because they're not. Paul writes in First Corinthians chapter four, verse 18. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. That's what Paul says. He thanks God that he speaks in tongues more than anyone. But what matters is that are we seeking to strengthen ourselves purely for ourselves or are we seeking to build up the whole church? We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 to 3, if I could speak in all the languages of earth and of the angels, but don't have love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I have the gift of prophecy and if I understood all God's secret plans and purposes and had all knowledge but if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others I would be nothing. If I gave everything to the poor and even sanctified my sacrificed my body sorry I could boast about it but if I didn't have love I will have gained nothing. Friends love is the key. Without love none of the spiritual gifts mean anything. So if you want to pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, what do you have to do? Pray. Ask God about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you a gift and to seek to use it. Look for opportunities to use it, to grow and develop in that gifting. Perhaps ask a leader to pray hands on you and pray with you. In conclusion, friends, we're called like Timothy to stir up the spiritual gifts that the Spirit has already imparted in our lives. The spiritual gifts are founded upon and grounded in love, and without love, they are nothing. So in the words of A.W. Tozer, revivals or any other spiritual gifts and graces come only to those who want them badly enough. It may be said without qualification that every man is as holy and as full of the Spirit as he wants to be. He may not be as full as he wishes he were, but he's most certainly as full as he wants to be. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? Just to, to leave us with today. That we're as full of the Holy Spirit as we want to be. Are we praying for more? Are we seeking more? Let, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray, Lord, that we might be those who seek for more of you so that we might be a blessing to those around us. 
Help us to love you and put you first in order that we might love our neighbour. And Lord, we just pray that we might earnestly desire those spiritual gifts to pursue love in order that we might build up the church into Christian maturity. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.